Hello and welcome to the Undertaker and the Pastor podcast. I am Jonathan Smith. I want to say thank you so very much for watching today. And I am the Thank you for watching today too. We really appreciate it. Yep. Jeff, we're looking forward to seeing what we get into tonight. I know last week was, um, or our last podcast was tough to deal with about dress and are we prepared to go to church and got some feedback on that. And we still have quite a few screenshots to go through as well. Um, do you want to open us up in prayer? Father, thank you for all your blessings. Lord, we are a truly blessed people, and all our blessings do come from you. Lord, we just ask you to be with us tonight. Give us your guidance and your will. Give us the words that you would have us to say, and just help us to enlighten some people, maybe touch their hearts, or maybe answer some questions. Maybe at least get some more discussion going, Lord. And in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Jeff, do you want to lead us off from here? Well, our last last podcast, we uh, started off with the uh, post that you put up and answering some questions. Do you have the post that you originally put up? I do. Give me just a moment. Let me, let me get it pulled up here. Anyway, and we got some quite some feedback on that, and um, so we were just going through looking at what's from some of the responses and comments, and just answering some of the comments. So, says I would rather hear a preacher that is spirit filled, wearing jeans and a hoodie, than a preacher that wears a suit and isn't spirit filled. And you can imagine, we got some good comments. We got some we'll answer. We got some we can't even show on there. We had to just delete. So, but we are going to start. Do you have a place that you want to start with a screenshot of a comment? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> pardon my page here. Let me take off my page because I have a ton that I don't want everybody to see in case we go through them. Um, I know that in our, uh, last podcast, we talked about, uh, someone asked me what it was to be spirit filled. We answered those questions for them. Mm -hmm. And, um, my screen went away, Jeff. Hopefully you've watched part one, but if not, we, we do encourage you to go back and watch part one. So you kind of on where we're at yes um so when they asked me what would classify as a spirit-filled preacher i said he must be saved qualified prayerful studied and doctrinally sound um had several people say that that was not correct um i don't know how they get that because when the holy spirit when god saves us he gives us the holy spirit to indwell in us to lead us and guide us in all truth so if he is all of those things, then he should be spirit-filled. Am I wrong on that? I would agree. I would agree. I where they where they came from on that? What thinking? Um. And then I know in our last podcast we dealt with uh, this particular screenshot. And I'll put it up here for everybody. He said, I would rather hear a spirit-filled preacher wearing a suit than one who is wearing jeans and a hoodie who is not. It works both ways. And then one gentleman said, I preach on. To me, it's a respect thing. But there are a lot of people, and Jeff, you jump in here on this. There are a lot of people who wears a suit and tie to church that, it, that they still don't respect Christ. That is true. That's just like there are a lot of preachers who don't respect Christ. There's a lot of preachers that just go to school because it's something they want to do. It's a job. There's a lot of so-called preachers that will probably be in hell. It's just like there are a lot of Christians that 
probably think they're going to heaven because they've shake, shooken, shaken the preacher's hand and filled out a card, but that's not it. And and they are they are going to be in hell unless they find the right way. It's more than just that. It's more than just respect. Um, you can respect the pulpit and the office of pastor, I believe, wearing a hoodie and jeans and speaking to a crowd that has hoodie and jeans on. I think if you have a crowd that has a suit, then somebody with a suit would reach them. I don't know that they would. Somebody that has a hoodie would reach somebody, I think, wearing a hoodie more quickly than they would a uptight, stuffy preacher telling them they're going to hell wearing a suit. A lot of pe- a lot of suit wearing preachers have done more damage to the name of Christ and the cause of Christ than somebody out here wearing a hoodie. Well, when I think about that, you know, the <clears throat> we talk about those wearing a suit has done a lot of damage, and they have. Um, you take Joel Osteen, for example, he's wear suits every he wears suits in every video that he ever makes but he doesn't preach the gospel. But I'm sure if you ask him why he wears a suit, it's a respect thing. Um, you take, for example, Jack Jack Scott. He wore a suit and a tie every Sunday and did ungodly things. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure if you ask him why he wore a suit every Sunday, it was because of a respect thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I totally disagree with it being respect thing. Um you respect Christ by living a life that is pleasing and honoring to him and living in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And if you do not do that, then you don't respect him, regardless if you wear a suit, regardless if you wear jeans and a hoodie, you you don't care. That's right. So this one here was funny, and I thought we should bring that up um, and touch on it because it's in this same uh, retrospect here. Um it says any preacher that refuses to wear ties behind the pulpit brings in contemporary music and lets his wife wear pants needs to be exposed publicly on social media. Yes. <laughs> Jeff, I'll give you the honors in taking care of this and addressing <laughs> this and I'll jump in. Well, I, I don't know what he means by exposed. I mean, I would think if you expose somebody, that's like 2020 doing an expose on a on somebody. And none of those things really to me. I mean, I, it, I think it's a choice if a pastor wants to wear a tie. I think it's a choice of the church, what the kind of music they want to listen to. And it's a choice if he lets his wife wear pants. There's nothing in the Bible that says, I know what I know I'm gonna get grief for this, but there's nothing in the Bible that says a woman has to wear a skirt to church or shouldn't wear pants. So I what they would expose her, and unless she's some kind of criminal that robbed a bank or something, I wouldn't think she would need to be exposed. Yeah, well, I I totally disagree with that remark. Number one, people don't again. It, Mark is probably an idiot, and I probably get a lot of keep just keep your cards and letters home because I understand what you're thinking. <laughs> well, I I'd go first of all. Any preacher that refuses to wear ties, that's between him and God. Right. Um, Contemporary music, we want to throw off on contemporary music. We hear a lot of preachers throw off on on contemporary music in the um, IFB circle, some of your SBC circles, your primitive Baptist. I'll blast it Baptist here for a minute. They want to fuss about contemporary music. They call it ungodly. They call it worldly. But if they would take five minutes and listen to the music, to the words of the music itself, they would find out that it 95% of your contemporary Christian music is more spiritual than a lot of your Southern gospel music and your church hymnal. Um, a lot of the IFB churches uses the Redback Church hymnal, which is a 
Church of God hymnal, which isn't even a Baptist hymnal, but there's songs in there, Jeff, that isn't biblically sound. One of the songs, one of the songs that uh, we used to hear sung a lot in church, "He Set Me Free." It says, "I'm climbing higher and higher each day." That's works based. Our salvation isn't based on works. Our salvation is based by grace through faith. They, we also sung another song that says, there's a God somewhere. It says the only thing that worries uh, God is you and me. We don't worry God. Our God is an all-knowing God. Our God is, uh, uh, our God is everywhere at one, at one time. There is nothing that worries God. You are correct. And then, um, and I can keep going on and on and on. Um, you know, they they will bash I saw the light and then turn around and rewrite it and make it all about telling women to keep her mouth shut in church. And they'll talk about uh, men having their hair cut a certain length and all of this. But when that song came out, a lot of churches condemned it. And if it was wrong to sing the original version, then why should we make a, fa a false version that we can poke fun and say irreverent things toward other people? A lot of people don't know the writer of that song was Hank, G Hank Williams Sr., who was a country singer back in the 50s, I guess. And uh, he got a lot of grief, and they wouldn't play it in songs in churches and, and things because of him being a country singer who sang in honky-tonks. And it was wrong. Well, I mean... It, it reached a lot of people and it's sung a lot now and it's actually in several hymn books. So, Yeah. And uh, I mean, we can just keep going on and on and on. You know, I remember, and I'm not throwing out at nobody, but I remember the inspirations come up with, out with a song called he climbing up the ladder, hold, he holding up the ladder that I'm climbing on. That wasn't, I mean, I understand it was about Jacob, but we're not climbing and working our way to heaven. And we have to realize that a lot of our contemporary music, I can take word for word and give you scripture that backs it up. Um, if you will check your messages on your cell phone, mm -hmm. I do a picture of a man that I have come across on Facebook in South Carolina. And he does not look like what most people calls, would call a pastor. But I have watched him on Facebook. And he, to me, is truly saved. I don't know what kind of life he's had. Uh, by looking at him, it looks like he might have had a, a kind of rough early life. Mm -hmm. But he's one of the men, I, I think, that he preaches the word. And he preaches, he's preaching truth. And um, I like to listen to him. So, I mean, I don't know if you want to show his picture, but I know I see on his Facebook and things that he has a lot. He preaches on Facebook and he has a lot of people that he is reaching. And this man can reach people that somebody behind a pulpit in a suit and tie cannot. And this is probably the best example of your, the I I can give of your post. I don't know All if you right. can call that out, nerd. Yeah. Give me just a second. I'm pulling it up now. Nerd here. And <laughs> preach. I preach a sound doctrine and I would listen to him. But anyway. There's a couple things, and I'm gonna touch on this. There's a couple things in this that the IF that I'm not going to say just the IFB, but there's well, several things in this picture that I want to address. Go ahead. I knew there was a couple things there. <laughs> Give me just a second. Let me get it pulled up. Keep talking for a minute while I get this pulled up, Jeff. Um, but yeah, um, I just think to try to disqualify a person because of how they look, or things that have happened in their life. There are some people that will look at people and disqualify them because 
what they used to do before they got saved. There's a lot of people that will disqualify somebody because they might have um, earrings, gauges in their ears, tattoos, um, or have been divorced before or something. But um, I think, you know, until you reach, until you know their heart, man doesn't know what God knows and God uses somebody. And, and if he chooses to use them, it's none of our business. What? And if they're not called by God, God will deal with them. It's not our place to deal with them. But if we put our tongue or, or talk about God's man, God will deal with us too. Touch not mine anointed. The Bible says, well, and that's the thing about that. You know, I was getting ready to, jump to that verse we use that a lot of times just as preachers and uh deacons and stuff but that's anybody that god is saved they're his anointed child that's true there's a lot there's a lot of churches that'll use that scripture to set their pastors up above somebody else and then the man they'll call themselves the man of God, and I know that anybody called by God is the man of God, but they they give themselves higher than normal. They put themselves on a pedestal in your church, and you better watch. You better watch them. And there's I've seen churches where they would have their de have the pastor would show off his deacons and have them bark like a dog and sit do commands like doing tricks and that that to me was diminishing first of all his office as a pastor by doing that and second of all another person as a, as a deacon yes i agree 100 percent on that another thing on that too is is uh, the other day and I'm, I'm gonna pull up this picture in just a second i was listening to a sermon clip and a preacher said, you need to get behind your man of God. You need to hide behind your man of God. You need to submit to your man of God. You need to come in second place to your man of God. No, that at that point is idol worship. You're putting your pastor on a pedestal. And if he falls, you're going to fall. The only person we are told to submit to and to put ourselves in second place to is to God. Right. So, all right, let's pull it up. Okay. There you go. So, um, you Sorry. know, the other... Oh, go ahead, Jeff. Computers or something. Can you <laughs> can you blow it up or whatever a little? Or maybe it's just I can't see it because I'm using my phone. But anyway, go ahead. Um, Looking at this picture, there's a couple things, and I'm not being critical at all. Um, I have been preaching for years. What are we going to do when the younger generation comes in and they're covered in tattoos and we say God calls them to teach or preach? This is a perfect example of that. Yep. Um, last a couple of weeks ago, I asked somebody about it and they said, God will have a remnant. Of course, you know, the remnant it is any man, woman, boy, or girl that gets saved. Um, also, and I'm not throwing off on this, I am not racist at all, so do not, please do not blast me for this. But mm -hmm. also, in the many years of sitting in Baptist churches in general, we have heard preaching and teaching against interracial marriage. Mm -hmm. And my question is, what happens if a person is married interracially and God calls them to preach and a church wants to call them to pastor? In the South, that's going to be a hard thing for a lot of people to accept. This is a prime example of that. We all preach and believe that divorce is wrong unless somebody steps outside the bounds of marriage. We also believe and preach that marriage is honorable in the sight of God. All right. So therefore, if it if I believe it's God's will for me to marry a black lady, a Hispanic lady, an Asian lady, whatever the race may be, that's between me and God. That's not for the church to say, oh, he shouldn't marry this particular race. We're out of the days of segregation. Mm hmm. 
So those are the two things that I seen right away that if we was to bring this family into our church, into a lot of our churches today, would they be accepted? And if somebody looked at that picture right there, nice picture, nice painting. But if God, if somebody looked at that picture right there and you told them he was a preacher, they'd start tearing him down. Oh, no. First of all, he's married to a black lady. Second of all, look at all those tattoos. He must have been a gang. He's very, you know, this, that, and the other, you know. And those aren't all of his tattoos. Just That's just a good, you know. But I've, like I've said, I've heard the man preach, and he, he preaches doctrinally sound. Well, and my question to anybody that's listening to the podcast is this. Number one, would you listen to a pastor that was interracially married? Number two, would you listen to a pastor with holes in his ears from his gauges from past? I don't think he should be in the pulpit with gauges in his ears. Don't get me wrong. But um, would you... Somebody with the plugs in their ears, the plastic plugs or something, than just a hole in their ear, though. I agree with that. Would you? Are you willing to sit and listen to somebody that is covered in tattoos? If your answer is no to all of those questions, then my question to you is, why? God has saved them. God has called them. And when we get to heaven, the Bible says we'll be known in heaven as we was on earth. So all of these all of these people that we're rejecting from serving in the church age is going to be in heaven worshiping with you. And if you can't worship with them here, how are you going to worship with them in heaven is my question. Well, my question is, if you don't want to worship with them or you don't want them in your church, are you saved? Will you be there? Exactly. I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, you know, and I hear a lot of things about um, well, when they get saved, they'll want to cover it up and all you can't cover up all of that. No. And we mentioned last episode, Kat Von D. She has chosen to black out her her tattoos that she has. And because that's what she feels like she needs to do because they were a lot of uh, a cultish type things. But just because you get saved, there's nothing that says you have to do that. There's a lot of people who are saved that still have tattoos. And there's a lot of people that regret their tattoos, but they still have them. God still loves them. There's a lot of preachers that are still saved still preaching, still have tattoos. Yes, I agree wholeheartedly with that. And, you know, it disgusts me to put, to hear people put Christians second class who have tattoos, who are interracially married, um, who've been through divorce, who have been in different situations. Oh, well, they're not, they're not fully serving God. Well, that sounds like something the Pharisees would say. Mm Mm-hmm. Jesus Jesus dealt with the Pharisees on a daily basis. And there's another thing we've talked about. We might, I might as well bring this one. We talked about this before. Um, nowadays, we have the gender movement, the, the pronouns, I'm, he, he, him, whatever, and I her she he she hers whatever but what if one of these people comes in gets saved one of these what if one of these people that say was a man that was changed to a woman or a woman that was changed that was i don't know what they call the word transgendered or whatever to a to a man what happens if they get saved and comes to your church it's not as easy to change that back as it is to change it now what they get and they're truly saved and they come to your church and they regret what they did and ask for forgiveness for it then what we We have to yeah we'll talk about we have to accept them before too yes me and you talked about this several times on the phone and we've went through hypothetical situations 
we have to accept them. We would accept a murderer if he got out of jail on early release and said he got saved. We accept drunks. We accept fornicators. We accept, adul- we accept adulterers. We accept idolaters. We accept liars. We accept God robbers. We accept everybody. So why in the name of God couldn't we accept a transgender person? Well, you know, the times, it's coming. What My- kind of- what if one of those supposedly, you know, meet all the qualifications of a bishop? That's what that's going to be a tough line to draw. It's going to be a hard line, but I mean, what if? Um, I think I'm. I think the best way to do would be if it if you was born a man and you became a woman. Right. Cut all your parts and changed all your parts. If you get what I mean, yeah, and you've become a woman, I don't, and you can't revert back. Yeah. Now some of them can revert back because they didn't have their parts cut off. Can't put it back on. Exactly. Um. Then my advice to them, if they was a man who used to be a woman, or a ugh, let me start over, a woman, if they're now a woman that used to be a man. And they come to me and said, listen, God saved me. God's changed me. What do I need to do? And they have made a total transformation to a woman. My encouragement to them would be, look, I know you can't go through the surgery and have your man stuff reattached if it's been cut off. I understand that. But you could, he could, he could, he or she could could go through the surgery and have the chest area removed. You agree? Mm-hmm. And they could cut their hair and revert back to a man's role. Mm-hmm. In that area. If you was a woman and you've reverted to a man, it would be nearly impossible to revert back to a woman. Right. Um. That's... That's a tough line. That's something that our churches need to get ready. But if one came to, if a, if what used to be a man that has become a woman came to me and said, Hey, God's called me into the ministry. I've been saved. I realized that I've done wrong. My personal opinion and personal conversation would be revert all that you can. You may not can reattach the man goodies. You may have to have, <laughs> Sorry, Jeff. I just didn't see it coming. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, you may not can re reassign yourself. Let's put it that way. But you can try to get as close as you can. Yes, and they may have taken like uh, hormones and stuff to where they can't grow facial hair, where they can't do a lot of those things. All that. Can you repeat that? I lost you. I said they can quit the hormones and all that stuff and try to get it back. Yes. That, I believe, is going to come sooner than later in our churches if the Lord tarries. Because, I mean, I know I've seen several things about movies and things where people have true stories of people that have done that before and then saw their their error and repented and were saved. And so that's, you know, you talk about the South, that's happening in the South. I'm sure there are people, it'll, it'll come to a church near us or to our church soon. And this is something I would encourage pastors to unite together on and sit down and have this conversation like in a group of pastors. And I don't want you to just grab Baptist pastors. I want you to grab Methodist. I want you to grab Pentecostal. I want you to grab church of God. I want you to grab everybody in your community as a pastor and say, let's have this conversation. That way all of our churches can be united around this issue on how we're going to handle it. Exactly. Exactly. And telling them you're not welcome here is not an answer. No. Does 
And if one ca- if a transgender person came to me and says, "Hey, I've just got saved. I want to serve." How long do we how long do we let them prove themselves? There's small things they can do to serve without having to themselves, I would think. Just let them show themselves, see their enthusiasm, because you don't want to cut. I mean, that'd be just like somebody getting saved in your church and coming to you and saying, I just got saved, I want to serve, and they're so-called regular or normal. You, You could... They can sweep the floors, take up offering something. I agree. Talking earlier about saying we're not welcome. You're not welcome in the church and that kind of thing. That defeats the meaning of the church to me. All should be welcome no matter what. Because, you know, the the Bible pretty much says, you know, that all are welcome to serve the Lord. You know, I mean, the, the the church is supposed to be a hospital for sinners and not just a playground for the saints. Well, Jesus said, they that are holy, not a physician, but they that are sick. Who is the sick? It's the lost. Right. And, and who he, he ministered to. And by us saying they're not welcome, by us saying people aren't welcome to come to our church makes me wonder if we have saved people sitting on the pews of our church. That's true. This A safe person wants to see sinners get saved. I guess that goes back to my thought from earlier, talking what makes you saved? How do you know you're saved? And do you act like you're saved? Exactly. You get saved the right way. Did you shake a preacher's hand or did you repent of your sins and accept Christ? Mm -hmm. I've often had this thought, you know, what would be worse than waking up and being in hell? Waking up in hell thinking that you were saved. And there's a lot of preachers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, church members who have wore suits every service, who have served, who have done all those things. And Jesus is going to look at him and say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Right. I need to step a second. I'm going to let you keep talking for just a second. I need Jeff stepped away for a second, so I'm going to uh, take over here. But yeah, that is a sad state of affairs that we are in, that men and women um, are not prepared to meet God. The Bible says this appointed unto man once to die and after this to judgment. My question is, are you prepared? Have you made your calling and your election sure? Are you ready to meet him? Have you accepted him as your personal Lord and Savior? It's more than repeating a prayer. It's more than um, at, it's more than shaking a preacher's hand. It's more than giving money to a church. It's more than the way you dress. It is having a relationship with God and saying, Dear God, I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all of my sins. And God, I'm asking you to come into my heart and life and save me before it's eternally too late. We are in a day and a time where there's false gospels, false teachers, false believers who are out here saying their repentance is not required for salvation. That is wrong for godly sorrow worketh repentance unto salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of this world worketh death. Jesus came on the scene and preached, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Salvation without repentance is no more than a profession without taking on the possession. And you and I today as Christians have the duty and the responsibility to go out and share the gospel with every man, woman, boy, and girl and encourage them 
to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and to repent and turn from their sin. Welcome back. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. So, talking about salvation and repentance, I want to touch on something. Last week, I heard two things that I want to dispute while we're here. You ready? Number one, it is not the only thing that you have to repent of in order to be saved is unbelief. No, I don't believe that. And the person that said this said that by us saying that that is untrue, then we're preaching a false gospel. Okay. So if only thing we have to repent of is unbelief, then why do we have the Ten Commandments? Right. If the only thing that we have to repent of is unbelief, why did Paul say, let, and they'll say, okay, the Ten Commandments is Old Testament. Well, let's go New Testament. When Paul gave out a list of sins, and he says, and such were some of you. Right. Did those people not repent of those sins? Well, I would think they did because he said were. Some of you. Exactly. And, and and repenting means you are turning. You turn 180 degrees and, and take, it's hard to repent without having something to turn away from. And unbelief is really not something I would, uh, unbelief would be part of what you needed to repent from. I would, that's, part of being saved you have to accept the lord you know abc accept believe and confess and confession is your repentance believing you know well it's you know repentance is a turning away um yeah. and when we accept christ we turn away from our service from satan to christ Right. There you go. That's a good way of putting it. So, okay. Second thing that I heard this past week. You'll like this one. I mean, you talked about this already. Is that when a sinner is cast into hell, we will shout. Oh, yeah. This one. <laughs> go ahead, repeat. So, this past week, I was listening to a preacher, and the preacher clearly stated, that when a sinner is cast into hell, we will shout. Right. I, 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 that's just so, so much there to unpack. I mean, first of all, I don't think we're going to know anything about what's going on in hell when we're in heaven. I disagree with that. Okay. Go ahead. All right. Luke. Yeah. <laughs> All right, here we go. Luke's gospel, chapter number 16. All right. In hell, the rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment. Right. Who did he see? He said, La he saw Lazarus. Where was Lazarus? In Abraham's bosom. Okay. So there was a conversation between the rich man in hell and Lazarus. Right. Okay. I believe that when we're at the judgment and the great white throne judgment is taking place, we will be sitting there in the gallery as Christ is throwing him into hell. Well, yeah. But when he... I would... Go ahead. So when he throws him into hell, I do not believe that we will rejoice. The Bible says that the angels rejoice in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, not over one sinner that is damned to hell. Bad day. Well, bad goes to hell. Yes, I agree. I believe that that is why the Bible says in Revelation that God will wipe all the tears from our eyes. 
because we will know some of those that are cast into the lake of fire. Some of those may be our mamas, some may be our daddies, some may be our brothers, some may be our sisters, some may be our aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, great-grandparents. Some of those may be our pastors, our Sunday school teachers, our deacons, people we've served with in the church. And just as we cry at their funeral when we bury them, we'll cry when they're being cast into the lake of fire. Okay. I get that. I wasn't talking about the white throne judgment, though. I was talking about during, like, I think, you know, there's people in heaven right now to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. So they're there. And they're worshiping Christ now. But there's people being thrown into hell every day, I believe. There are people that are going to hell. So that's what I'm saying. I don't think we know now. I think we'll know at the great white ju- white throne judgment, but that's going to be, I think he'll bring us, at, bring people back out of hell and out of heaven to be judged. Mm-hmm. I do too. That's, so that's what I was thinking of. And that's where he says we will shout when they're cast into the lake of fire. Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't think that's, I think that's dumb. Why would we be happy? over somebody going to hell and shouting for them to go to hell. Yeah, I agree wholeheartedly. That that makes zero sense. Um, no. We don't rejoice when we know someone goes to hell on this side of eternity, so why would we rejoice in heaven? It's a sad thing. So. Now, I, know, I know you've passed, you preached funerals for people that you didn't know whether they went to hell or not. And I know that you, you, you toiled over that. And I know exactly, especially one recently that we worked on together. I know that it was a sad thing for you and you were toiling over, over how to talk, but you did a great job by the way. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And I used to think, hell and we should never cheer over that but that's just a dumb thing to say i think for a pastor now that that church what else is he telling that church probably that it's more important than somebody's life (laughs) guys if you don't know anything about me and jeff me and jeff spend hours upon hours listening to sermons, sermon clips, reading documents, documentaries, reading books. We read all kinds of stuff. Actually, read the Bible, commentaries, everything. Actually, Jeff told me the other day that his wife came to him, or Jeff was telling his wife that uh, me and him had read the same article on, on something recently. And she said, my God, how much do y'all read? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't, we didn't know it either. We had just, I I was mentioning something I had read and he said, I read the same thing. So, and it's going to come up as something we were both researching for a future podcast. So we've got two or three we are wanting to do. So we're definitely researching those out. So. Yeah, pretty soon. Well, Jeff, I've got everything done that I want to say. How about you, sir? Yeah, I think we've cleaned out this this one. Yep. Yes. I like that. So, this is what I want. That's the problem in the church. I'm just looking at that. If you don't mind me elaborating just another minute, but it says I'm rooting for you. We don't have enough cheerleaders in the church anymore. We don't have somebody that's just going to get behind you and say, I know I, I'm, we both have a friend and his biggest, one of his sayings is when he sees us is I've got your back in prayer. We don't have enough people that have your back in prayer. We don't have enough people in the church that have your back. We need people that will cheer you on and support you and just say, I'm praying for you, or I thank God for you. Just something. Cheer somebody up. Cheer them along, because you don't know what's happening. You're exactly right. 
That was my little rant. Sorry. No, you're good. And I th- and I'll be honest, and I don't want to name drop here, uh, but one of the biggest cheerleaders, anybody that knows me, I've I've been through a divorce and had some tough times with it from the different movement of the church, uh, not my personal church, but churches around future podcast. <laughs> yes, it is a future podcast. Um, but I have had somebody that has been a cheerleader that has stood behind me, that has pushed me to stay where I'm at. And I'm grateful for that because the, one of the biggest problems that we have in the church, I said, I was done. One of the biggest problems we have in the church it's friendly fire. Yeah. We're quick to shoot our own when they're down. Or cannibal Christians who will eat their own. Yes. Yep. 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 And they gladly, they, they take more pride in shooting somebody down or talking about somebody than they do somebody being saved. <laughs> and it's really and sad. We, I'm glad that you've got a cheerleader. I've got, a couple I can think of and I'm really, really proud to have them. And it, it really makes me feel good. Well, but several people that, that aren't, and they're just people that look for you to fall. Mm-hmm. Well, I'll, I've known, I, I want to say publicly, one of my biggest cheerleaders is you. And I appreciate that. You was with me right when uh, I first started going through my divorce, I actually was working at your place of business and, um, you and I talked in depth about it. And I remember one of the questions you asked me, what are you going to do about pastor? And I said, I don't know. And you said, stay with it. You said it won't be yeah. popular. It won't be easy, but stay with it. And I appreciate that. I appreciate you. You've been a cheerleader and uh, too. So, all right. Well, are you done, sir? Hey. These, the opinions expressed on this podcast are the opinions of Jonathan and I. They don't have anything to do with our church, families, place of work, especially some of our families. We, they don't agree with a lot of stuff we say, but these are just our opinions. So please remember that. And if, if you are going to nitpick the, the podcast, please make sure you do it in context and not just take something we say and rip it out of proportion because <laughs> we do, we do go back and listen. I do go back yeah, and we, listen to the podcast. Uh, we try to answer some of the comments, whether good or bad. Some of them, if you cuss or get belligerent, we will just delete them and not even worry about it. But others, we will try to answer Yes. All right. Well, let's dismiss in a word of prayer. My dear Grace, Father, Lord, I want to thank you for another opportunity to gather around tonight and pray and talk with Jeff, the biblical things. And Lord, we pray tonight that something that we've said or done will bring glory and honor to you. And Lord, I pray as we continue on with this podcast that you will allow us to reach the lost, encourage the saved, Uh, draw back the backslidden to you and all these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. All right. All right, sir. Well, thank you so much. You. We'll see you next time. See you next time.